we did a pulled pork on Washington's Sol Patterson's about a month or two ago because it was uh, on our buy list, but just below the QAV cutoff score of 0.1. I think it was about 0.08 from memory. And uh, one of our listeners asked some questions about it. And interesting company. I went back and had a look. I mean, I've known about it for a long time. It's been one of the largest listed investment companies in Australia. But it's been a, a, a bit of a different one because they have really only had concentrated investments in companies which they got involved in when they were small and then have just uh, stayed with them as they've grown. So companies like New Hope Coal and TPG, the telecom group, I think that's two of their largest holdings. They, they probably have a couple of other ones as well. So interesting listed investment company. The history of the company goes right back to the early settlements in Sydney when two chemists merged, Washington, Seoul and Pattinson's. There's a third person must have joined at some stage. And so they were a, a chemist, they were a chain of pharmacies, and then they listed. And I guess because they were profitable, they started to invest in other things. And that eventually became the listed investment company, Washington Sol Pattinson. And so it's been going around for a long time. And the, the chairman, a guy called Robert Milner, is a direct descendant of uh, the original founders. So it's been kind of family controlled for a long time. So that's uh, Washington Sol Pats in a nutshell. We're going to talk to Todd Barlow, the CEO today. And I had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of weeks ago via Alex Hay, my stockbroker. We went in and had a, a cup of coffee with him, but it turned out it lasted about an hour while we um, did a deep dive into their business. And I guess a couple of things, they merged with or took over a company called Milton, which is another large listed investment company which Rob Milner was also chairman of. So I guess that's one of the reasons why um, they merged. But um, Milton was your more classical listed investment company in that even though it was actively managed, it pretty much hugged the index. So it, over time, it grew up to have large holdings and all the big you know, ASX top 20 stocks and some of the smaller ones as well. So that's become part of Washington Sol Pats. And so it started to become more interesting to Insto investors who haven't really been shareholders in Pats over the past because, uh, you know, they're basically saying, well, you've got four or five big investments and, and we've got a fund of large investments. Why would we back you over our ability to, to find investments? And so Sol Pats hasn't had a large institutional profile or institutional holding on its register. It's mainly been mum and dad retail investors who've liked the story and liked the journey along the way. Bob Milner has sometimes been called Australia's Warren Buffett. I know that gets tossed around a lot, but uh, he, he's known for being a value investor. He's known for you know, this ability to pick companies when they're small and watch them grow until they're large and stay with them. And along the way, Sol Pats has outperformed the index over the long term, which is something that, as we know from our research, most active fund managers can't do. So very interesting to talk to Todd. Really pleased he gave up his time to talk to our listeners. and. I wouldn't be surprised if Sol Pats comes onto the buy list at some stage in the future, given all the operating cash that it's throwing off at the moment. Jesus, when I said do a little bit of an intro, I thought you were going to go, and ladies and gentlemen, here's Todd Barlow. <laughs> <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, here's Todd Barlow. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks, uh, Todd, for allowing us to talk to you today. Uh, we do have some listeners who are interested in um, investing in uh, your company, Washington Sol Patterson. So maybe you could give us a bit of a potted history on on the company and how did it get to where it is today? Sure. No, thanks very much for the opportunity. I think most people would be familiar with the Sol Patterson brand of chemists, and that was originally what the business was established as. Uh, it listed in 1903 as a pharmacy business and grew quite strongly through the first half of the, the 20th century. And then um, uh, then it started branching out into other investments in you know after the Second World War. So what people are probably less familiar with is Sol Pattinson as a as a brand of, of, of investor and quite a successful Australian investor at that. We retained our interests in Australian pharmacy and our connection to the Sol Pattinson name right up until last year, actually. And we sold our interests in API, uh, which at the time was only about one and a half percent of our broader portfolio. We sold that to West Farmers as part of their takeover of Australian pharmaceutical industries. But 
So today we we have you know no uh, ongoing connection to the Australian sole patents and pharmacy chain. We're a diversified investment house. Last year we further diversified with the merger uh, with with Milton Corporation and LIC. That took a to about $10 billion market cap or $10 billion of assets. We have about 60,000 shareholders and yeah, we're one of uh, the top 50 companies in, on, on the ASX in terms of size. So it really is a, a very um, diversified portfolio. There's over 300 investments, but you know, we do have some big positions in great Australian companies like uh, TPG, uh, New Hope and, and Brickworks, which have been established in the, in the portfolio over a very long period of time. Yeah, interesting. So can you tell me more about the history of those investments? The sort of story of uh, SOL that I'm, I'm familiar with is one of buying into those companies when they're small and then uh, staying with them when they grow. Is, is What's the process that you normally go through to invest? Yeah, well, I think if, uh, I mean, each of them have, have had their own their own history, of course, but um, TPG is a really interesting one. It started out as a, a distressed investment in a Newcastle-based television station called NBN, which was a carrier for the Channel 9 network up from Newcastle all the way up to the Gold Coast. And um, somewhere along the way, they decided that, or they realised that they were carrying a spectrum that would carry the uh, television signal, that could also carry telecommunications signal. So they set up a little telco business. And from there, we slowly acquired other bits of network and and customer opportunities and um, that was then floated off as a business called SP Telemedia or Salt Patents in Telemedia. Then we eventually sold the, the TV network back to Channel 9 and merged with TPG, which was a, a very small broadband business back then. But we had lots of network infrastructure. They had quite a few customers, so it was quite a nice fit. That was in 2007, I think it was. And, uh, and the combined market cap of those businesses then was, was under $300 million. And from there, we you know, supported them with an acquisition plan that added pipe networks, AAPT, IINet, eventually merging with Vodafone. And today, it's you know very significant size business, I think somewhere around the $10 billion mark. And we've never sold a share. So the whole time, we've, um, we've been on that journey with them. And, and I think that's, that there's a sort of similar story with New Hope. You know, we went into Indonesia. We got out of Indonesia. We bought and sold assets along the way. And we've always supported those management teams taking a long-term view, buying good assets at the right time in the cycle and building a business that's attracted to growth. So you said that uh, the original MBA or MBN investment was uh, a distressed investment. Is that something that you look for uh, very deeply valued stocks? Is that part of the process? I think if you are a, if you're looking for bargains, you are naturally going to be attracted to distressed situations. But we also realise that we are not in the business of conducting turnarounds. We don't have the ability to invest in businesses and show them a pathway to turn their businesses around into a better performing business. But we are attracted to situations where there's distress because of stretched balance sheets, as an example, which can easily be cured with the cash injection, or if it's simply just a a point in time because, uh, you know, the short-term fundamentals for that business are are distressed, but we see better times ahead. So that, you know, coal is a classic example where there's been plenty of opportunities to buy distressed assets at the right time in, in, in various cycles. So, so we're not attracted to poor businesses. We're attracted to good businesses that have a, a poor operating condition at a point in time. And there's been plenty of examples uh, of that. But yeah, I mean, I guess on the question of, of value investing, it's an interesting one because if you, if you look at the spectrum of value versus growth, I'd say we are very much at the, the value end in the sense that we like real businesses with cash flows that we can value and assets that we can value. We like obviously buying things at a discount, but it's not always easy to buy things at a discount. The market's pretty efficient. And the reality is you don't necessarily make huge amounts of money just hunting for bargains the whole time because you know you might be able to get something at a, a small discount, but that's ultimately going to be an inferior outcome then if you can buy something that is growing really quickly, uh, has lots of opportunities for increasing its market size and market share in an industry that has tailwinds that are you know, allowing it to grow faster than the system. So we actually have a lot of aspects to us that are, that are growth oriented, but you know, we do tend to stay away from businesses that we have trouble understanding from a valuation perspective. So if it's a startup, 
It doesn't have many assets. It's high a high multiple. They are things that classically we have stayed away from. But we we very much like to buy good quality businesses that we can take on a growth journey. It's almost like a partnership arrangement. It's it's reminiscent of Berk- Berkshire Hathaway in, in terms of what what you're doing there. Is I guess I wouldn't be the first person to draw that analogy for soul pets. Yeah, we've had that before, and it's a, <laughs> it's it's a very uh, humbling um, comparison because obviously. Yeah, Warren Buffett has uh, done some amazing things and 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 uh, is an incredibly uh, great investor. But it wasn't necessarily us mirroring his approach. I guess it's just common sense investing that tends to have some parallels to to his approach. And I guess that's probably the the nicest thing that can be said about us is that we employ a common sense approach. But there's absolutely ways that you can engineer your own returns and um, telling people to be a patient long-term investor, support them with capital to grow when the rest of the market is is not investing, buying weaker competitors at the right time, integrating well, getting that growth. You get a higher multiple with a bigger business, you get synergies. There's lots of ways that you can engineer returns just taking a long-term approach and, um, and supporting people with capital. So who's the next TPG that you are looking at at the moment or you have acquired at the moment? One thing that we we needed to do was build out our base of opportunities and what we call platform companies that we can grow into the next TPG. And we didn't do it particularly well. We probably spent most of the 2000s actually putting our private equity investments into the public domain and, and spending a lot of time on growing New Hope and TPG uh, you know, in particular. We did huge amounts of M&A in, in those businesses. And one of the issues that we had, if I go back to the start of 2021, about 75% of our portfolio was comprised of TPG, New Hope, Brickworks, and, and then API. And they all had been such successful investments. They had very low tax cost basis. So if we were going to invest in the next new thing, we had to really sell one of our major investments. And, and to do so would have incurred a, a 30% tax cost straight away. So if I had a dollar in TPG two years ago and sold it, I'd end up with 70 cents. And now I've got to put that 70 cents to work and I've got to generate in excess of 40% return just to get back to square one. So uh, that was a, a bit of a challenge for us to, to have the capital and liquidity to build out our base. So we solved that with the, the merger of Milton and, and Milton did two things for us. Not only did it give us more liquidity to be able to execute on the deal flow that we were seeing and, and build out those new opportunities, but it also generated some tax benefits to us that, that actually enables us to look at all of our assets in our portfolio you know, to fund any new investment. And so that's a very powerful thing for us. So now we've got a, uh, a portfolio of private equity assets that we've built out over the last couple of years. Uh, it's about $700 million. We've got assets like swim schools, which are uh, not the hugest. You know, I can't see that being a $10 billion kind of telco business, but you know, it's highly cash generative, uh, recession proof in the sense that people are always going to teach their kids to swim. It's a cottage industry. It's ripe for consolidation. So that's something that's quite interesting to us. We've put quite a lot of money into agriculture and we're up to about $500 million in, in agriculture. Uh, sorry, about $300 million in agriculture, I should say. About $500 million of, of gross assets. And then we've also invested into a business called Amp Control, which uh, we now own 100% of, and that's an electrical engineering business. We think that there's huge scope for that business to service the growing need for the energy transition and uh, grid renewal and renewable energy type things that will happen over the next couple of decades and more. And we're very much taking a picks and shovels approach to that that kind of energy transition that, that's that's occurring. So we think that there's lots of opportunity to build out a business that is the the known brand to service the huge amounts of capital expenditure that will go into the energy transition. Yeah, thanks for that. That's really interesting. And I guess you don't know out of those three which one might become another TPG or another NHC, New Hope Coal. You're sort of just backing them all and, and it'll play out over the long term. Yeah, you know, there'll be a point where where a, a big opportunity presents itself. And, and yeah, you know, the other one that we've got in our private equity portfolio is is wealth advisory in, in a business called Ironbark. And um, you know, you, we're seeing the the amount of corporate activity around the wealth space and uh, funds management and 
you know, financial services and you know you could just find a really great opportunity uh, where any one of those could, could grow into something quite significant. It gives us that uh, ability to be able to execute on those opportunities if we have an established position and an established management team so that we've got comfortable with the industry, we've got comfortable with the people who can identify the opportunity and, and it means that we can more readily take advantage of a new situation. Whereas if we were coming in cold, we've got to kind of get comfortable with the industry, we've got to get comfortable with the people that we're going to get into bed with and that's before you even get, get comfortable with the investment. Yeah, interesting. Let me just wind back a step here and, and ask you about Milton. So that was more of a traditional LIC in terms of it, uh, even though it wasn't an index fund, it did have index fund type qualities to it. You spoke about the tax side of that, so that I can understand why that would be a benefit to merging, but how has the merger of Milton changed Sol Pattinson or, or has it changed Sol Pattinson going forward? Well, it was primarily, you know, the tax benefits were were an absolute advantage and it was, you know, some, some of those were unexpected. But the primary motivation was to get access to liquidity to further diversify the portfolio and take advantage of some of the, you know, the new opportunities that we were seeing. So we wanted to, you know, we were quite comfortable. It wasn't about concentration risk that we had with our existing investments because they'd served us very well for a very long period of time. And, uh, and because they were largely uncorrelated, even when one was underperforming, the portfolio as a whole performed quite strongly. So it wasn't so much about concentration risk, but what it, it was at that point that I was talking about earlier, whereby we couldn't fund new opportunities because we were tax constrained. And so it was about getting access to funds. And we really wanted to build out other asset classes. We were seeing lots of deal flow and opportunity in the private equity assets that I was just talking about because we want to build that base out again because we always see good value in, in private equity. I think there's you know, better value to be had, but more opportunities to grow the business. It's quite hard to, to grow listed companies because even though most people get listed to get access to capital, the reality is you've kind of got to go to all shareholders and you've got to go through a process and it's quite constrained. But in a private equity sense, you can just you know be very flexible about the way that you fund a business that you wholly own. So we quite like the the way that private equity businesses can grow more quickly than they would if they were in the public domain. But, but equally, we also like sending in private equity businesses that have developed to a point back to the public domain because that provides them with a discipline. You know, I think that once you get into the public markets and take on other shareholders, you are constantly committed to growth. You know, you can have a good year and your shareholders say, well, that's great, what are you going to do for me next year? And so there's, you know, you're on the treadmill and you constantly have to perform in the public market. So we quite like building up a business in a private atmosphere and then taking it uh, public over time. But the other aspect that we're seeing lots of opportunity in, and it's sort of partly a macro condition situation, but the we're developing a, uh, a portfolio of what we're calling structured credit or yield instruments. And uh, last year that delivered us about nearly 10% uh, cash return. And this year it's getting better. And that's because the, the bond rates are obviously increasing, but also the, the spreads, uh, corporate spreads for debt are increasing as well. So we're seeing lots of opportunity to deploy capital into corporate credit instruments that are paying us more than 10% yield. And in our mind, that's a better risk adjusted return than, than investing in equity markets where the long-term total return is something less than 10% and you're taking market risk. You're taking macro risk. And um, and if I was looking at the next 10 years, it probably feels like there's a few challenges ahead of us. So if we can get paid more than the long-term average of the equity markets and protect our downside at the same time, that just seems like a really good good place for us to invest at the moment. That's not available though to retail investors. That's something you're doing on a corporate level. Is that right? That's right. And that's really, you know, coming back to your question around how Milton has has changed us and what's changed for a Milton investor as well. You know, if I think about the classic LIC, it is going to perform in line with the market at best. You know, the reality is uh, a lot of active managers underperform the market uh, and there's a variety of reasons for that. Some of those in an LIC environment are structural. You know, there's restrictions on how much concentration they can take or how much turnover they can do in their portfolio as an example. But also it's just, you know, the culture and, and investment style of LICs has tended to be quite conservative and uh, an index hugging and, and you know very diversified in the sense that they 
sprinkle their investments across the market. So that, that's always going to make it challenging to meaningfully outperform. Whereas what an investor is getting with Souls now is, is a truly diversified portfolio. And we think about diversification as not sprinkling across the market, but actually being diversified across uh, different asset classes that perform differently in different parts of the cycle. And that protects your risk. And so what we are very focused on is protecting capital. That's our source of our performance. So LICs will largely rise and fall in line with the, the market. So people think that they're, they're diversified and they're reducing their risk, but actually what they're doing is just taking market risk. And so what, what you're getting with sole patents is not only access to those asset classes that most retail investors can't get access to themselves, but they're getting access to a portfolio that over time has protected capital on the downside and in general outperformed. So we think that's a pretty compelling opportunity and there's nothing else like it on the ASX. I think you're right. I mean, it's, it's um, looking at your numbers, you have outperformed the market over the long term and that's something to be very happy with, I guess. And it, it doesn't happen with leaks and it doesn't happen with fund managers. So it's surprising that you don't really have natural competitors doing the same thing as you because it's, it's proved to be a winning formula, the sort of concentration into asset classes and growing things from small to, to large, uh, taking a long-term view. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, when I think about the source of our outperformance, so much of it comes from capital protection. And it's one thing that a classic fund manager or, or, or an index fund or an LIC doesn't do because it is going to largely perform in line with the, the market. And um, and so, we, you know, I'm reminded of Warren Buffett's kind of number one rule for investing, you know, don't lose money. And the number two rule is don't forget number one. And people think, well, how do you do that? I mean, if you're going to have a diversified portfolio that performs in line with the market, you will lose money because the market will sometimes go negative. Although over time, if you take a long-term approach and, and you're patient, you shouldn't lose money because the market generally goes up over time. But the reality is people do take their money out at exactly the wrong time and put it in at exactly the wrong time. But if I look at the way that our portfolio has performed in negative times, we actually do a lot better. And so over the last 20 years, we did an analysis and found that about a third of the months, a third of the 240 months over the last 20 years, the market was actually negative. And in each of those months when the market is negative, our shares perform almost 2% better per month. So we do a lot better when the market is negative. And I think that that's a, um, a really important way to, to outperform. So a lot of people, you know, when they think about outperformance, they think, oh, well, that's because you, know, you had one good investment here and you got lucky and all that sort of stuff. That, that's actually not our approach at all. Our approach is, is to grind it out and make sure that we protect capital and, and uh, just eke out those small outperformance gear on you. Yeah, and well, well done. One of the uh, questions I wanted to ask you was about the operating cash flow increases that I saw in the last 12 months at, at Sol. And that's really put you on our radar screens and quality at value investors look at operating cash flow as a key metric. Was that due to the Milton merger or, or something else? Really, it's hard to pin it down because it was across the board. We, we had all of our major investments were growing uh, dividends. Now, number one on the list was New Hope. New Hope has had a phenomenal year and is, is operating in a phenomenal environment. But TPG, you know, started off at quite just before the Vodafone merger. You might recall that TPG was thinking about building out its own mobile network and it was actually withholding dividends to prepare for that. Then it realised that that was unlikely to happen. The cost would have been too extreme, and then that drove them to a, a merger with Vodafone. And and so what we're seeing as a result of that is the synergies are being realised. The business is is growing well, and the and the dividends are growing out of TPG, and that's that's quite good. Brickworks is a fabulous business. It hasn't reduced uh, its dividend for fifty years. But what we're really starting to see now is the the growth in our private equity and structured yield portfolios are generating very high cash returns. So as those portfolios grow, you know, we'll start to see some really strong cash generation out of those. So as I said, the, you know, the structure of yield is in excess of 10% return, which is a lot higher than market for dividend yields, but also the private equity returns are very high as well. And you know, I think on average, if I looked across the private equity portfolio, we're probably getting cash generation of something like 10% there as well. So as we allocate more to those types of asset classes, uh, it's just going to drag up the cash generation. When we think about the cash generation of our business, we, we, you know, we don't look at the P&L because that's a sort of misleading figure in our case because we aggregate you know, some investments around the place and, 
some are consolidated, some are equity accounted, and, and, and so it sends a mixed message. But so we just say, just focus on the cash, just focus on the cash that we generate from our portfolio, and that is in the form of either interest income or dividends. And that was up significantly last year, and that was despite taking on a whole lot more shares that we issued to Milton shareholders. But that enabled us to, to increase dividends by 16% last year. Now, that also tells the market about our view about the long-term cash flows because we don't want to increase to a point where we can't beat it the next year. We, we've had an over 20-year history of increasing dividends year on year. And so when we increase dividends, it, it's, it's telling you that we feel good that we're going to be able to better it next year. Well, that was my next question. Is it cyclical or will the cash flow keep increasing? But I think you've answered that one for me. I guess to just build on the cyclical side of things, though, what's, I mean, you, you're an inside player with New Hope in the commodities market. What's your view on coal and, and does it matter to, to solve? It does matter. It's, a, it's a, a reasonable part of our portfolio in terms of value. You know, it's, it's a little volatile at the moment, but it's somewhere between 10 and 15% of our asset value. It's a, a reasonable chunk of our cash generation. But, you know, our, our view on coal is that if I go back a few years, people were, and, and the coal price was under $50 and people were saying, well, this is the end of coal and, you know, should you divest and, and, and move on? And our view was that, you know, we can't turn off coal overnight. It's going to take some time for the energy trans- transition to, to play out. There's a very significant marketplace for coal. And in fact, it's, I think, the, the largest source of, of energy in the world today. As the population increases and electrification increases, a lot of, of the new energy that's required will be sourced from other areas, but it's going to be really hard to meaningfully eat into the, the coal generation capacity in, in the short term. And we don't need to take a long-term view here, I mean, a really long-term view, like, like our assets uh, are approved out till the end of the 2030s, so you know, we've probably got 15 to 20 years of life that we're looking at here. There's no new supply coming on. The demand we think is quite sound. The costs are going up. So the, the price of coal has to be relatively high. But I, I also don't even need to take a, a view that long either. I mean, the current share price of, of New Hope reflects about a two, two and a half time EBITDA multiple. And I think if I look at the, the asset that we bought in the Hunter Valley about five or six years ago, it paid us back in the first four years. Now that's pretty good, but that was through a pretty average coal cycle, you know, part of the coal cycle, it paid us back again the following 18 months and it will pay us back again in less than a year. So, you know, if, if you can buy those kinds of assets with that kind of cash generation, you don't need to take a really long-term view. And the key for us will be to take those cash flows and put them into other assets so that we can uh, build up a sustainable portfolio that's that's equipped to deal with the eventual end of coal or the eventual divestment of, of our coal interests or, or, or however however it ends. I think it's got a lot of life in it, but there's, uh, there's lots of opportunities for us to deploy that cash into other assets and continue the great story. That's great. Thank you. So I think well, I'm coming up to the end of the time, but um, that's fascinating to hear you talk about it and very interesting to get the insights. Cam, do you have any questions before we go? Just one last quick one, Todd, I was wondering what your exposure has been to crypto over the last few years and, uh, <laughs> you know, what position. You must have been under a lot of pressure, I would imagine, as we all have been over crypto for the last few years. You want to give me a quick uh, summary of your position there? It's a pretty easy one. I, I, I think that that is the, the last kind of asset that we'd ever have in our portfolio. If we had invested, we would have got a lot more pressure than than, than not investing. <laughs> you know, I think it's it's the kind of asset class that is uh, is the opposite of what our investors are looking for in, in an investment in our portfolio. That's good. Okay, <laughs> thanks. That's the only question I had. <laughs> thanks very much for your time, Mr. Barlow. We appreciate it. No, thank you. Thanks for the chat. Thanks, Todd. Thanks for your time. The QAV podcast is a production of Space. Craft Publishing Proprietary Limited, authorised representative of AFSL 520442, AFS representative number 00129218.
Please don't make any investment decisions based solely on listening to this podcast. This is presented as general advice only, not personal financial advice. We don't know your personal financial circumstances. Please see a financial planner before making any investing decisions.